If you enjoy catapulting into space to learn how planets came to be, I highly suggest you catapult back to Middle Earth in another Edgeworks Nebula show called You Have My Sword. We learn from time traveler and chainmail expert Christy Pride, who guides us through Tolkien's Middle Earth. Whether you're talking Middle Earth or the middle of space, someone else always has to carry on the story. New episodes every Tuesday, available wherever you get your podcasts. If you watched the films and were like, hey, what's that weird light bulb Galadriel gave Frodo? And why did she give it to him? Why did that spider hate it? Is it just an elven cum jar? Let's talk about it. Hello, hi, we are talking about the file of Galadriel today, which was a crystal file that held the light of Arendil's star, which was the light of the two trees as preserved in a Silmaril. This light was collected into the file from the Mirror of Galadriel, which was a basin of water which could show visions of the past and the future, although it was never certain that future events would come to pass. So, what is Arendil's star? The star of Arendil, also known as Gil Estel, was a light created by the Silmaril carried into the sky by Arendil the Mariner. It was mostly visible in the morning and the evening and was often referred to as the evening star. Arendil was a great half-elven mariner who once voyaged to Valinar and went before the Valar on behalf of the children of Iluvatar. He was the father of Elros, the first king of Numenor, and of Elrond, whom we know and love, the Lord of Rivendell. Of course, there is much more to Rendil's lore, so we'll cover him in his own episode, but hopefully that context sheds a little light. Get it? Light? <laughs> okay, that's the end of the episode, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm just kidding. Let's talk about the two trees for a second. The two trees of Valinor, also known as the trees of the Valar, or simply the two trees. These two trees, one of silver and one of gold, brought light to the land of the Valar in ancient times. The gold tree was called Lalorian, and the silver tree was called Telperion. They were, of course, <laughs> destroyed by Melkor with the help of Shelob's ancient mother, who was called Ungoliant. She was also a giant spider, for those wondering. But the last flower and the last fruit were taken and made by the Velar into the sun and the moon. Finally out of reach of that fucker Melkor. Third time's a charm, I guess. If you listen to the flat Middle Earth episode, you'll recall I talked about the two lamps of Middle Earth. Um, that were also cast down by Melkor. <laughs> uh, these lamps were well before the two trees, in case you were wondering about a timeline here. I know it can get confusing. And for good measure, the Silmarils were gems that were crafted of the hard crystalline substance called uh, Selima, which Feanor has devised as their shell and um, were obviously named after this material. In their heart burned some of the light of Valinor from the two trees. Uh, the exact nature and manner of making the Silmarils were known only to Feanor, and nobody else had ever succeeded in or even came close to making gems of comparable greatness and beauty. Uh, Varda hollowed the Silmarils so that no mortal or evil hands were allowed to touch them without being burned or withered. Well, I hate to spoil anything, but I will say to that, that did not work out as intended, um, but we can cover it in full in a different episode. Now, with all that said, there is a clear theme here with light in Tolkien's works, which I feel is of particular interest. Um, and it's important to consider when talking about the file of Galadriel in particular. So, why did Galadriel give this treasure to Frodo? Assigned with an impossible task, Galadriel gives Frodo the power of light, which glows radiantly in places of darkness to help him on his quest, as she knows where he is going is uh, dark and terrible, to say the least. The light also has a purity to it, almost a holy water effect, which is why evil often recoils at the vibrancy of it. It's probably safe to say that she gifts this to Frodo because she knows the path he must take for his journey. Um, she knows that they must travel past the two Watchers who guarded the Tower of Kirith on Gold, 
Galadriel is known to see things that have not yet come to pass, which could be why she knew to gift this to Frodo um, and subsequently Sam, since Sam also uses the file um, as well. Now, how did the file come in handy? Frodo used the mere touch of the file to ease the thought of the One Ring when he, Sam, and Gollum were watching the Witch King lead his army out of Minas Morgul. He also used it while entering into Mordor to defend himself from Shelob. Uh, when Shelob first approached, Sam reminded Frodo of the quote-unquote star glass, which the file is often referred to, and its light drove Shelob away. Frodo exclaimed in Quenya, Aya Arendil, Elenion Ankalima, which in Elvish translates to Hail Arendil, brightest of stars. Um, my Elvish is not great. I am working on it. Um, but I mean, you guys will send me hate mail anyways. Um, <laughs> so um, remember uh, kind of when I told you how Shelob's mother helped Melkor nuke the two trees? Um, this is likely why Shelob was not stoked to see the light of them shining from the hands of a tiny man in a cape, which is probably why Shelob sees this light and, and absolutely backs away, which gives Frodo and Sam time to escape. Frodo gave the light to Sam to hold while he cut through Shelob's webbing, and Sam wielded it when he attacked Shelob to rescue Frodo. The star glass shone even brighter than normal in response to Sam's indomitable spirit, which is so pure and so cute. Sam used it twice to get past the two watchers. The second time, the file shone out lightning bright in tribute to his hardiness and faithfulness. Sam also attempted to use a light in the crack of doom, but the light from the glass faded because they were in the heart of Sauron's domain. So quite simply, it was too evil to use where they were at. The two watchers let out painful screams each time they were presented with the light of Arendil. Again, sort of reinstating that this light has a kind of holy punishing effect against evil and is not simply just a flashlight for Frodo's journey. While Tolkien never really provides a definitive answer to how magic works in his universe, it's easy to find context that things tend to be imbued with certain abilities either by race, lineage, or quite simply fate. Uh, Tolkien tends to leave magic pretty up in the air, allowing readers to sort of push past the ambiguity and simply enjoy the wonderment of it. There is uh, something more magical in, in not knowing for sure how or why at least in my opinion. But let's talk about Galadriel for a second. This task was appointed to you. And if you do not find a way, no one will. Uh, Galadriel is ancient. She's one of the oldest bitches in the game. She came with the first elven exiles to Middle-earth and was born even before the First Age, putting her at around 7,000 years old by the time of the War of the Ring. She knew the light of Valinor before the dimming of the trees. She probably knew Feanor and saw the Silmarils before they were taken by Morgoth as well. She was tutored by Melian and the Maya. Sauron, Gandalf, and Saruman were all Maya. They're, I mean, technically gods, essentially. Um, and she also possesses one of the Elven Rings, which we covered in episode two. Her power, uh, while ambiguous, essentially keeps several hosts of orcs out of uh, Lorien during the War of the Ring. And Tolkien several times has considered her to be one of the most powerful elves in Middle-earth, so it's no wonder her power is both great and mysterious. So on the topic of the ambiguity of magic in Middle-earth, how did Galadriel capture the light in her file? Let me read to you first a passage from the Fellowship of the Ring. And you, ring-bearer, she said, turning to Frodo, I come to you last, who are not last in my thoughts. For you I have prepared this. She held up a small crystal file. It glittered as she moved it, and rays of white light sprang from her hand. In this file, she said, is caught the light of Arendil star, set amid the waters of my fountain. It will shine still brighter when night is about you. May it be a light to you in dark places when all other lights go out. Which we also hear her say in the movie, which is beautiful. Galadriel is one of the few elves knowledgeable and powerful enough to contain light like this. This is because she is so ancient that as a Noldor elf, she had been a pupil under Aule and Yavanna. 
While essentially being a ward under Aule, she would have learned much about craftsmanship in general and how to imbue objects with magic and power. Another reason she's so capable is due to the ring she wears. Uh, she wears Nenya, the elven ring of adamant, which enhances her natural abilities so that all the lore she acquired from Aule, Yavanna, and Melian become more potent due to the divine mechanism of Sauron's power, who was also a pupil of Aule, within them. Tolkien has said that, the chief power of all the rings was the preservation or slowing of decay but also they enhance the natural powers of a possessor. Galadriel was elite in craftsmanship due to the teachings of Aule and the Vala, and during the Third Age, she began to really hone her skills while using Nenya to gain additional insight and power, which in return gave her the capability of creating the star glass and preserving Arendil's star which is no small feat. <laughs> All that to say that yes, Galadriel very likely is one, if not the only person capable of preserving this light. I have wondered though why Galadriel chose a file, uh, which implies a stopper at the top. Does this suggest that the light could be released? Did she know that it was best not to trap the light forever as Feanor had, learning the consequences of coveting such a thing? Or was it simply just a cool bottle she had on hand? And with that, I think we'll end this episode here. I hope this has inspired you all to up your cum jar game, go thrift yourself an antique file and fucking do it right. Um, well, it looks like I forgot to add a creator to shout out at the end here. So I'm going to shout out myself for talking to myself yet again and surviving it. You guys have no idea, or maybe you do. Some of you might. But in general, it is so difficult to sit down and fucking talk to yourself for half an hour, sometimes longer, if you incessantly fuck up like I do. It often feels impossible. Why I chose to do a podcast by myself and not with a second person to volley conversation against, I'll never know. Uh, I live to suffer. As always, check out youhavemysordpodcast.com for links to all our socials, our Patreon, or my coffee page will grant you access to my Discord channel, which is growing more and more unhinged as time passes. And I'd really like you to be there. And as always, you have my sword. Okay, bye. <laughs> Edric's Nebula.